Good morning, everybody. While you are standing, let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Holy Father, for gathering your dear children once again this morning that we can come before your holy presence to be taught by you. As you taught them wonderfully and powerfully in the morning session, we pray that once again, you will teach us. Because you said, Lord, that you will gather your remnants in this place, in this Lancaster, where they can be taught by you, where you will teach them, make your ways known to them, and restore them to their fullest destiny. And also, Crown them with your goodness and empower them with your mighty spirit in spirit, soul, and body. And also to be transformed by your majestic grace. For such a purpose, you have gathered them here, Lord. And all those who are watching online, and through satellite television. I ask you now to open the eyes of their understanding. Give them an understanding heart and a listening ear that they may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. In the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And please be seated. I hope you all had a great sleep last night. <laughs> did you? Yes. Wonderful. Which means you did not pray. <laughs> See, I caught you. <laughs> if you had a peaceful sleep, it means that you did not pray. See? If you had travailed, you could not have slept. But nevertheless, God is our good God. Yes. I'm sure you prayed. Yes. Because you prayed, you slept well. Yes. Amen. Amen. See how kind-hearted I am. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a two-part message. Part one will be this morning and part two will be tomorrow. Last month, or not last month, early this month, the first week of this month, the Lord called me to fast for seven days. He said, come and sit with me. I want to talk with you. And I know whenever the Lord calls me for such extended fast, besides my regular days of fastings, and I know he has something very important to communicate some revelations for the church or sometimes something personal for me but usually it will be something that is largely for the body of Christ to prepare them for what is to come and to make the ways of God known so from the 1st of August to the 7th of August I was waiting before God and on the 2nd of August as I was meditating the scriptures on at, at about 10 o'clock at night, I heard the Lord Jesus say, do you want to come to my house? You know, if the Lord Jesus asks you a question like that, who would want to say, no, I don't think so? <laughs> would you? No. no. And neither would we say, Lord, I'm too tired today. Let me come tomorrow. Would you say that? No. Neither would we say, oh Lord, it's already late. Can we do it tomorrow at a more convenient time? We wouldn't say that, right? None of us in our right mind would say that because this is a, 
a once in a lifetime opportunity you don't want to miss you never know whether you'll get a second chance or not so when you do not know perhaps there will be but if you do not know why miss this opportunity am i right so i said yes lord and the very next instant i found my soul before the throne of the lord jesus christ and uh, as soon as he saw me he said come so i i went near to the lord and i noticed a large ivory box like a chess it was before below the bottom of the throne of the lord and he opened the chess and i saw many scrolls in it and among the many he picked the one scroll and he said look and when it opened or before it opened there on the scroll was written the word book or the title book of mysteries and then when he unfolded the scroll he unfolded it to a section called the last days mysteries the mysteries that belong to the last days if you read revelation chapter 10 verse 7 it says there that when the seventh angel blows his trumpet the mysteries of god will be made manifest now we are living in that time that is why god is making his many mysteries known to the body of christ now why does he make that known to us because before the bride can be raptured she must grow to the full stature and the full measure like the lord jesus if you read luke chapter 3 it says that when the lord jesus as a 12 year old boy came back from jerusalem it says that he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature two kinds of growth physical growth as well as in wisdom so as growing in wisdom and grew in stature and now ephesians chapter 4 tells us we must all come to the full stature of the lord jesus christ secondly full knowledge of the lord jesus christ so similar to how the lord jesus grew full in wisdom and full in stature so that being the case before the bride can be raptured now the lord is releasing all those mysteries and the wisdom kept hidden from the ages so that the bride can be full of the wisdom and the knowledge of god so this is number 1 number 2 the book of revelation is not written in a chronological order chapter 1 chapter 2 chapter 3 chapter 4 it's written like that for our understanding however the events that are mentioned there are not written in a chronological order which means the events of chapter 4 will not necessarily take place after the events in chapter 3 not in those order so we, many many theologians and bible scholars go in error interpreting the book of revelation because they think the book of revelation is written in that chronological order so they interpret it in such okay these events will take place that when not even uh, the um, uh, the evangelical leaders but even pentecostal leaders for example in revelation chapter 4 verse 1 where it is written john hearing the lord jesus say come up so that many pentecostal teachers interpret to mean the rapture of the church that this is the rapture of the church has already taken place why one well, the reason is like this in chapter 2 and chapter 3 the lord jesus talks about the seven churches and then from chapter 4 onwards there's never a word mentioned about a church so therefore the logical interpretation is when john was caught up the church was caught up 
But John is not the church. Right? He's a prophet there. If John was the church, then why talk about the seven churches in Revelation? So, when the Lord Jesus spoke about the seven churches in Revelation, those seven churches literally existed at his time. So the seven churches existed, so did John. Both existed at the same time. So if John was caught up, those churches should also be caught up. So the rapture should have taken place in the first century, isn't it? That is not so. So the Apostle John had a powerful experience to be caught up to heaven, to see the wonders of heaven, so that he can write to us, telling us things that must shortly come to pass. You look at things from heaven's perspective. What is taking place in heaven? This is what the last day's remnant will be privileged to know. This is where God, God is calling you to rise up to that destiny. What you read in the book of Revelation, the experiences that the Apostle John had, every one of us here can have the same experiences. Do you believe them? Yes. Every one of us can. And we must pay the same price. That's the cardinal qualification. Not only the price, but that amount of consecration. That is one of the key themes of Brother Jeremiah Johnson. Right? These past three sessions that he spoke, his chief theme, if you notice, is consecration. Consecration is the after effect of repentance. So when you repent, you consecrate yourselves afresh to God. So the degree of consecration, number three, qualification, surrender. You totally surrender. When you surrender, that surrender must be without any strings attached. This is our problem. When we make a surrender to the Lord, we have strings attached. Lord, I'll surrender, but, buts. We put many buts there. And our surrender is not a total surrender. It's 10% surrender or 20% surrender. Unless and until there is a 100% surrender, then it is counted as truly consecrated. If there is no 100% surrender, then you are not consecrated. We are not truly consecrated. We are not truly consecrated and set apart for the master's use. You know, the very word set apart, it means it cannot be used for any other purpose. And that translates to mean, if you are set apart for God, the you, you, does not exist. See, you're already set apart. So you cannot be used for any other purpose. Meaning, yourself does not exist anymore. To satisfy the self, the pleasures of the self, the pleasures of things pertaining to the flesh, must be all crucified. It doesn't exist. We must come to that level. Of course, it's absolutely possible. At the same time, we cannot deny the fact that it takes time. The degree, upon the degree of your consecration, then the grace will begin to increase in your life. On the first night, I shared with you about Brother A. A. Allen. Remember? Yes. That God had him, that he really sought God, and then he had a powerful ministry after that. But I purposely left, up, left aside one important part of his encounter. In the encounter, the Lord Jesus appeared as a ball of light before him, 
and spoke to him of 11 things or 13 13 things that are a stumbling block in his life that is preventing him from a total consecration so the lord told him the day that you get rid of all the 13 that's the day the fullness of the spirit will manifest in your life so he wrote down all the 13 points on a piece of paper and the last two were very very personal to him so he did not even share that with his wife absolutely too personal so he erased them from the note that he had written and he eventually wrote a book called greater power to the nice no, sorry tomorrow i'll tell you the name of the book okay <laughs> i i i forgot but it's available for free on the internet so you can go and download if i'm too kind i'll give you the link to where you can download okay? <laughs> the price huh? the price ah the price of the price of god's miracle working power if you just google it thank god for google you know and you will you will find links and then you can find free download so just click the free download and you can have it and you can read it so now the point is this so those 11 points that the lord spoke to him which are general for everybody based on scriptures that's why he wrote a book on it so each time he overcomes one he'll just tick tick on the list eventually he reached the bottom of the list all 13 when all 13 were tick he was truly consecrated truly consecrated it was after that he saw the fullness of the power of the spirit manifest in his life so that's the key So the fullness of the spirit comes in totally yielded. That's point number four, yielding, totally yielding, yielding to the Lord. So, in a nutshell, what those four points means is this: you die. Simple, isn't it? You die because the dead knows nothing. Have you been to funerals? Yeah. I'm sure you do. Have you walked past by the coffin, and you see the dead person in the coffin? Does the dead person ever keeps an account of who came, who didn't come? <laughs> no, they don't even care who came or who did not come. They don't mark attendance, do they? No. The dead knows nothing. We must come to that state. of dying where it it doesn't matter any more your reputation doesn't matter any more you are totally dead so your own will your own desires your own ways don't matter any more this we find personified in the life of the lord jesus though been god he thought it not robbery to be equal with god meaning when he was not equated with god it didn't bother him it didn't bother him he emptied himself of all that not only put away divinity you know even the thought of divinity he put it away now this thinking is a great enemy we must control we must overcome because externally you may be humble but your heart may not be humble your mind may not be humble your mind will desire to be recognized but externally you may be pretending okay doesn't matter doesn't matter have you experienced that it doesn't matter but your heart and your mind will be thinking Oh my they did not recognize me See this mind 
This is what it means in Philippians 2, 6. He thought it not robbery. See, thought it not robbery, thought it thinking. Even the thinking must die. Your thought life must die. Be crucified. This enemy, you must crucify it. Never ever, even the slightest moment of feeling, looking at self, I am insulted. I am ill spoken of. The moment you try to look at yourself, then you will know that the I is still alive. Then you want to kill it. You want to crucify it. We must come to the state where you are dead. Whatever people want to criticize you, speak about you, praise the Lord. Glory to the Most High God. It's not easy, but you can get there. You can get there. For that, we, we all need the anointing of a duck. You have never heard of that anointing? Oh, you poor thing. You want to know? Yes. Very simple. What is the anointing of the duck? Have you heard of this proverb that says, like water on a duck's back? Uh, that's the anointing of the duck. Water does not stay on a duck's back, right? It just flows away. So that's that anointing. Don't let anything stay on you. Let it just flow away. Let it flow away. Now listen. Not only negativism, the worst is positivism. Not only people criticizing you, but the worst enemy is people praising you. That is the worst enemy. Worse than criticism. Because criticism brings you down. Praise puffs you up. So, have the anointing of a duck. Amen. See what a powerful animal duck is. So, remember this. God in his great goodness is revealing himself so that the bride of Christ can come to a full maturity. And like I said yesterday, last night, we should not just be hearers of the word. We must become doers, practitioners. Only then you can go from glory to glory. If you are just hearers, then it does you no good. It is my desire. It's not only my desire, it's the desire of God. That all the saints who come here, should be transformed into the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there are many prophecies spoken over Lancaster. Not only it will be a city of refuge, but also an oasis. An oasis during the end times. You know the natural definition of an oasis, right? But Spiritually speaking, even during the end times, when there is a famine for the word, but in this place of oasis, you will find the word. This place, there will be abundance. So that is why the remnant who are gathered must become transformed. Must become transformed. How you are, in 2019, should not how you should be in 2020. You must have grown one step higher. Amen. When a little kid goes to school, he, he joins in grade one. The following year, he goes to grade two. Have you seen any kid for 10 years is still in grade one? No. If he's still in grade one, something's wrong with him. Right? He should progress from grade 1 to 10 and then 12 and then to college and then to all the various degrees that are possible. 
progress. So we should progress. Amen. So when this book of mysteries were opened, so I saw this section, the last days mysteries. Among the many mysteries of the last days, one particular mystery that was shown to me was Mystery Babylon. That's, that's the section I saw, Mystery Babylon. And the Lord then began to speak to me about Mystery Babylon. You know, there are two parts to the subject of Mystery Babylon. And there are two chapters devoted to this subject in the book of Revelation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, an entire chapter was devoted to the speaking in unknown tongues. In the book of James chapter 3, an entire chapter was devoted to the natural tongue. So whenever one entire chapter is devoted to one particular subject, you must understand the great importance of it for the apostles to talk a great deal on that subject. And then in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, an entire two chapters, one long sermon was given by the Lord Jesus Christ before, one week before his crucifixion about the end times. One long, two long chapters. So we want to pay attention to those things. And then in Matthew chapter 23, one entire chapter, he rebukes the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the church leaders of today. One entire chapter given to them. You want to read what are the rebukes so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. So in Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18, Two entire chapters were written specifically about Mystery Babylon. Why two entire chapters? If not that this is a very important thing in the last days. So please take note of that. This is something of great significance and importance in these last days. Mystery Babylon, Revelation chapter 17 verse 5 is where you'll find the word Mystery Babylon being mentioned. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. When the Apostle John was taken in the spirit to a wilderness and he saw this woman and on her forehead he saw all these names that were written about her. Now you all know very well that names convey character. It's not just a name. It conveys a character. Like Abraham, father of nations. Sarah, mother of nations. Jesus, the one who saves. So the names signify their characters. Similarly, now all these names, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of fathers, abominations of the earth. Those are the four characteristics about this Babylon. So is it Babylon is a literal Babylon as well as spiritual. This morning, I will share with you about the literal Babylon. And then tomorrow, we'll look at the spiritual Babylon, the spirit behind Babylon. In everything, there is a spirit behind it, both good and bad. There's a spirit that works it. It's not just an external working. Why are gay people just simply gays? How can someone signify, all my life I thought I was a gay? Why do they, have you heard people say that? How could they suddenly say like that? Recently I read in the news, 
a mother came out and make a declaration for her two boys. One was eight and the other was nine. And she said, I want to declare to the whole world that my two sons are transgenders. How did an eight-year-old boy and nine-year-old boy know they are transgenders? And the mother is making that declaration. And in Sweden, there is a law, national law, that you cannot force your children to be a male or female. Let them discover themselves. They may be a male today, but along the way, they may want to be a female. So as a result, the law encourages every family to cross-dress their children. One day, they are dressed as a male. Another day, they are dressed as a female. And then another day, cross-dress. So as the children grow up, they don't grow up knowing who they are. They grow up confused. Am I right? Totally confused. And they become like zombies. Can you imagine your little kids? From two years old, you cross-dress them. The boy, your, your son or your grandson, you are calling him Michael, 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 or boy, boy, boy. And then you dress him like a girl. So this little boy will be thinking, who am I? A boy or a girl? So he'll grow up. You know what is this? What? What? Screwed up in his mind. That's not an offensive word, is it? No, okay. Not crazy, just screwed up in the mind. And there is a spirit behind that. It's a spirit. A spirit that promotes gayism. A spirit that promotes lesbianism. A spirit that promotes transgenderism. That makes them feel like that. It's a spirit that incites them. That gives them those tendencies against nature. This is what you'll find in Romans chapter 1. That against nature, a man goes after man. A woman goes after a woman. You'll never find any animal doing that, you know. Have you? No. They have better sense. Right? When the time comes for them to mate, the male will look for a female. But here, man who's supposed to be the highest of God's creation is going against the order of nature. And the laws of the land tells you that's okay. So there's a spirit behind all this. So what is Babylon? Babylon plays an important role in the last days in relationship to end time prophecies. So as much as Jerusalem is going to be very important, the church, so is going to be Babylon, a trinity. Remember these three, Jerusalem, church, Babylon. Let us consider a few facts. Babylon, the word Babylon is mentioned more than 280 times in the Bible. Number two, the book of Revelation contains 404 verses. Out of the 404 verses, 44 are specifically written about Babylon. So which is 11%. 11% of the entire book of Revelation has talks about Babylon. So 1% is important enough, but here you have 11%. Number three, next to Jerusalem, the city of Babylon is the second most mentioned city in the whole Bible. A tale of two cities. Number four, Jerusalem means a city of peace, while Babylon means a city of confusion and war. See, perfect opposite to what Jerusalem is. In Revelation chapter 21, 
verses 2 to 3, Jerusalem is portrayed as a city of God. Whereas in Revelation chapter 18 verse 2, Babylon is portrayed as a demonic city. Jerusalem is a place where God dwells and Babylon is where demons dwell. You know, that can refer to Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. After the war in the heavens, Michael and his angels got victory over the devil and his angels and the devil and his angels were cast down to earth. So when they were cast down to the earth, they come to inhabit Babylon. Already made ready for them. Babylon becomes a city full of demons. Now God's temple was built in Jerusalem. Whereas the altar for Satan was built in the ancient city called Shinar in ancient Babylon. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 to 10 tells us that New Jerusalem was called or is called the chaste bride of Christ. Whereas Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 3 calls the new Babylon a great prostitute. Again, two opposites. In Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4, New Jerusalem is called an eternal city. And you know the word eternal means forever. Whereas in Revelation chapter 18 verse 8, the scripture says that this new Babylon or the last days Babylon will eventually be destroyed at the coming of the Lord Jesus or before the coming of the Lord Jesus. So to summarize these facts, as it was in the past, when there was an ancient Babylon, so will there be a new Babylon in these last days. Do you know that before the US invaded Iraq, President Saddam Hussein considered himself as the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. And he proclaimed that it was his destiny to rebuild Babylon. So in the ancient ruins of Babylon, he began to build the same old city, the same palace that Nebuchadnezzar had made. He even had bricks made with his name, Saddam Hussein on one side, and on another side is Nebuchadnezzar. If you go to Iraq today, and you can go and visit Babylon, the city of Babylon, the entire ruins of where the Babylon was has now turned into a tourist site. And you can just walk down. I've been there twice. So what I'm saying to you, I'm an eyewitness to that. And you can go to the palace, the half-built palace, incomplete palace of Nebuchadnezzar tried to build. The bricks all has his names there. Now, Saddam Hussein wanted to restore the old glory of Babylon, but it was not the right time. So he was taken out. It was taken out. And he, it was not the right time. Secondly, he was not the right person to rebuild Babylon. That is the call given to the Antichrist. He will come to do that, not Nebuchadnezzar. So that is why he was removed so that he could not preempt the seasons and the times that God has kept in his hands. Even the good and the bad in the world, remember this, the seasons and the times are in the hands of God. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 to 42, the prophet Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar that it's God who appoints kings and it's God who pulls down kingdoms. It's God who does all that. He's the one who appoints kings. He's the one who appoints governments. 
he not the public who cast their ballot vote you all know too well that during the past election presidential election all the polls showed that mrs clinton will win the election am i right even on the day of the election till midday the results all pointed to hillary winning the election they were about to celebrate when suddenly there was a turn <laughs> suddenly suddenly even mr trump thought he has lost right suddenly that suddenly is not russia you know not russia is the finger of god amen finger of god because heaven had determined that mr trump will be the next president god had already determined that so the people in the world their hearts were all turned it was god who turned the hearts now go and cast your votes for mr trump sudden turn around that took place at midday so it's god who appoints kings it's god who appoints governments so the seasons and the times are in the hands of god sometimes we don't understand why these things are happening how can god appoint a communist government if it is god who appoints then it also means did god appoint the communist government who is torturing the christians we can ask a valid question like that do you know in 1959 when china invaded tibet and took possession of tibet 100 tibetan refugees or tibetans left tibet and became refugees in india so was the dalai lama so till today they cry over their lost city their lost nation and we feel so sad that all this mess have taken place a poor people have been displaced and all that but do you know because of the communists when they invaded tibet they destroyed 6000 tibetan monasteries which were heavens for evil they were destroyed number 2 the hundreds and thousands if not millions of monks were sent back as farmers they were reeducated retrained to become ordinary farmers if not if tibet had existed till today as how it was originally every westerner would have flocked to tibet and become buddhist and brought back tantric buddhism and fill the whole of europe and the whole of north america tantric buddhism is different from the buddhism that buddha founded tantric buddhism is a mixture of buddhist teachings plus demon worship it's a mixture they worship demons they worship magic mystery they practice divination they practice sooth saying all that is a mixture of tantric buddhism which was the chief religion in tibet in the early years now then we fast forward back to the present times in 1984 the chinese government reopened the nation of tibet to the outside world from 1959 to 1983 no outsiders were allowed to enter into tibet they were banned but in 84 the government opened the doors and let tourists come in as soon as they opened the door there was a great influx of western tourists into tibet every day now this is the statistics every day there were 8000 westerners who visited tibet and the reason why they come to tibet is not to see how good the country is but to learn buddhism 
I personally met three Westerners during my first trip to Tibet. One woman from Spain, one guy from Germany, and one guy from Belgium. We, we were traveling together from New Delhi in India to Nepal, and then from Nepal to Tibet. And I asked them, why are you going to Tibet? And every one of them said, we want to learn Buddhism. Can you imagine every day, not a month or a year, each day, 8,000 Westerners were flocking into Tibet. So what did God do? He turned the heart of the communist government and in 1989, Tibet was closed. Close to outside travelers. So no Westerners can go in again. Close. From 1989 right up to 1992. So when 1992, when the country was reopened again, but it was reopened with limited travel, which means backpackers not welcome. You must go in an organized tour, 10 in a group. So who want to pay big money to go? So that costs tourists to go down. See, it's God is in control. The next thing is, during this period of communist rule, people discovered that communism is empty. The church in China grew many times more during the communist regime than they were before. So you see, even an evil king or an evil government is an instrument in the hands of God. So all we have to do is submit to the goodness of God, to the wisdom of God, He knows best. And pray for your government. That's our duty. To pray for the government, whether you like or you don't like. It doesn't matter who comes to office. A Christians, a good Bible-believing Christian's duty is to pray for the government. Pray for the king, pray for the president, pray for the prime minister, pray for all the ministers and secretaries that work together with the leader so that we can live peaceful lives. See, this is God's counsel for us. Now some historical facts about Babylon. Now, the reason why I'm giving you this information is because what happened in the past is going to be repeated again in the future. So in order to know the future, we need to look at the past. This was how Babylon was in the past. This is how she will become again in the future. Number one, ancient Babylon was situated in a plain called Shinar. Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. Now, where is Shinar? Shinar is situate, situated by the banks of the Euphrates River, which is 50 miles south of Baghdad. So, it is a beautiful one hour drive by car that you go past by all the nice cities of Iraq and you eventually reach the ancient city of Babylon. When you step foot at the gates of Babylon, you are transported back 3,000 years. Whatever your eyes will see in that place are 3,000 years old. So back to the future. There's similarity, no? There's a car in that movie and you take a car in the real. Same. Number three. Old ancient Babylon was an important commercial and trade center. It was a bustling, bustling commercial center like New York, London, France, Paris, all those important cities. By the way, New York is not Babylon. Many preachers preach like that. They're, New York is Babylon or America is Babylon. No. They are not, it is not Babylon. Babylon will be Babylon. 
Number four, it was a powerful kingdom during the years 1792 to 1750 BC. Number five, it was a powerful military nation, militarily very powerful. And in 597, Babylon conquered Jerusalem. Second Kings chapter 24. Verse ten. Now God allowed Jerusalem to be conquered because of their sins, and God said, "I will use the Babylonians to discipline you and humble you." Now here you you have a direct scriptural evidence that God uses nations to discipline other nations and to subdue other nations. Is the hand of God, similar to what I just told you about China and Tibet. In the same manner, during the communist regime in China, the Christians became very strong and bold. During seasons of persecution, they were made very strong, very bold. And so are the Christians in Russia. Now Russia, Mr. Putin has enacted new laws. Now they are going back to the cold days of once again persecution for Christians. After the fall of communism, there was a respite, days of respite for the Christians in Russia. Now they are going back to the old days. Presently, no foreigner, foreign Christian preacher, is allowed to enter Russia. You can go as a tourist, but you are not allowed to preach in any church, even in a church, not allowed. You are not allowed to visit any Christians. You are not allowed to give any tracts. You are not allowed to do any of these religious things. And for the Russian Christians, they can worship in their own homes. Or in their officially designated churches, but not evangelize. These are the old laws that came back again, came back again. So Babylon was a militarily powerful nation. Number six, it was a very religious nation or religious culture. It believed in the worship of many gods and goddesses. And we think that India has many gods. The ancient Babylon had more gods or similar gods, hundreds and thousands, if not millions, of gods and goddesses. And there is a god for everything: a god of the wood, a god of the tree, the god of current, the god of this, god of that, a god for everything. So they worship a pantheon of gods and goddesses. and each city had a patron god and a temple every nook of the corner of the streets you will find a small altar or a small temple and there is a god for that this was found in babylon i was shocked when i first went to nepal in 1986 at at the turn of every street and at the turn of even the corners of a street there is a small altar and the pious hindus in nepal they would reverently bow down and worship those gods and those altars and even feed them i saw a woman feeding rice to these idols that's how religious they were i saw what i saw in nepal made me realize how the babylonians would have been very very religious people and being religious they had two kinds of practices one they practice divination witchcraft and magic daniel chapter 1 verse 20 chapter 2 verse 2 verse 10 verse 27 chapter 4 verse 7 chapter 5 verse 7 and verse 11 in all the scriptures you'll find 
mention in the book of Daniel about the religious background of the Babylonians. They practice divination, witchcraft, magic, and they were soothsayers. Soothsayers meaning they were prophesizing. So they prophesied. Besides that, they were also great in astrology. Thank you.